Hi, this is Scott with Spectre Gear. We're back with the second part in the series uh, of applying the fundamental shooting skills to mastering our double action trigger on our revolvers. Um, the first of the fundamentals that we're going to cover, and to remind you, the five fundamentals are going to be stance, grip, sight picture, trigger control, and follow through. Um, again, we're going to be doing stance in a separate video following this series out on the range. But uh, the first of the fundamentals is going to be one of the most important of the fundamentals. Uh, even though we're talking about trigger control, our grip is going to form the foundation of everything that we do in operating the trigger on a double action revolver. And the first thing I'm going to point out is the first thing that has to be evaluated, and this is going to be important towards uh, selecting a proper weapon for you, is understanding that the the workspace that you have to even start with is going to be critically important. And I have two examples here. I've got an in-frame. Uh, this is a, a Smith Wesson in-frame. It's a model 24-344 Special. And it's an in-frame and it's a big gun. And this gun fits my hand perfectly because I have very large hands. Now the inverse opposite of that is going to be a little bitty J-frame snub nose such as a 637, little 38 Special rig here. And this is going to re represent, for me, a very poor choice. Um, but for some folks, depending on your hand size, it may be the opposite. And i give you an example. I've got a fairly large hand. Now, this gun fits into my hand uh, pretty, pretty nicely, actually. I can cover the whole thing with it. Now, when I go to grip up on this gun, my problem is I don't have enough real estate to even work with. In order to achieve a proper firing grip on this weapon, at best I can get two thumbs, but the problem is I can get too much finger on there. Um, um, when I wrap my mitt completely around this, this gun, now I can isolate it and I can lock it down and I've learned how to do that by making a very deliberate fist here and I can get all the fingers out of the way. But if I get sloppy or I get, get a poor presentation on this coming out of the, the holster um, and I set up a situation where I get a little too high on the back strap and I get a little too much thumb forward, I can, and here let me show clear real quick, I can actually set up a condition where my thumb actually gets in the way of my trigger finger and I can't even operate the trigger. So for some folks a J-frame may actually be too small. Uh, for you to even fire effectively and it's going to be a problem for you developing trigger control skills going forward because the damn gun is too small also despite the fact that i have a huge hand because there are some pretty good gaps in here this gun moves around a lot in my hand now it does that for pretty much everyone but if I had a smaller hand, I could get a little bit more contact with a, a little flesh to grip contact there to keep it from moving. So for me, a J-frame is a difficult gun to shoot. And primarily, it's difficult because of the small grip size. Now, for a person with a small hand, I've encountered people where to them, this fits them absolutely perfect. But they go to pick up this end frame and they can't even get their finger on the trigger. Now, for me, the end frame is absolutely perfect. Everything fits. The grip fits my hand perfectly. And these grips in particular, which are made by Hogue, um, they fit my hand perfectly. So everything on this gun is absolute Goldilocks zone for me. I can get just the right amount of finger on the trigger. Everything works perfect for me and I can, I can operate with this weapon much more efficiently than I can with a J-frame. Now back that up a little bit. I don't have it uh, with me at the moment, but an SP-101, which is somewhere in the middle here, is a snub and it is small and it is just a little bit bigger than a J frame, but it works perfect. Uh, I can actually shoot that one just as well as I can shoot the end frame. More on that later when I talk about the SP-101. But again, fundamental wise, everything related to your trigger press is going to start with the grip. So we need to first learn how to properly grip the weapon. Now, you probably at some point have heard this, you're going to hear it again, when you grip the weapon, and, and this is going to be on the holster, coming out of the holster, you get your combat firing grip, so you don't have to shift anything when you bring or present the weapon up to the eye. When you do so, you want to be high on a back strap. Now, this is the back strap, from the butt of the weapon to this point right here. This area here, this is not the back strap. The hammer arcs through this point. You don't want anything in there to interfere with the hammer. So you want to be high on a back strap, but not over so much that you actually block the hammer. Now, being high on the back strap is going to deliver a couple of good results for you. First off, it places the web of your hand closer to the axis of the bore, and that is that line. 
described from the muzzle all the way back. It's a nice straight line. The closer you are to that line, the more directly the recoil is going to come back into your hand. The higher it is above the web of your hand, the more it provides a fulcrum point because the recoil is its energy, okay? So you have mass uh, and inertia going to the rear. When they hit the web of your hand, they're going to stop because they can't go through your hand. So the energy is going to follow the point of least resistance, and that's going to be this pivot point that's formed right here at the top of the web of your hand, and the muzzle is now going to try to pivot over the top of that. It's called muzzle flip. The higher you are, the less muz muzzle flip you're going to, going to see, and that's also called perceived recoil. So you want to be, as I said, nice and high. Now there's another uh, reason for that, and that has to do with trigger geometry. Now what's going to happen with this trigger is this trigger does not go straight to the rear. This trigger has a pin and it pivots, so it's going to sweep in a slight upward motion, and there's also a curve in the trigger to affect that. So as you as you press the trigger, essentially all you're doing is just closing the remainder of your hand. So you have a partially formed fist like this. The trigger is all it's going to do is just close into that fist. All you're doing is just fully completing the fist movement. Now, if your web of your hand is up here, that line is from here to here. It also follows the sweep of the trigger, which is to the rear and upwards. So it all flows. Let's show clear before I do this. So it all flows in a nice direction, right towards the web of your hand, nice and naturally. Now, where it becomes a problem is if you're low in the back strap, if you're down here, it's going to have a couple of effects. First off, it places that fulcrum point for that muzzle inner, or muzzle flip lower on your hand, so you have more mass, thus you're going to have more perceived recoil. So you're going to have a lot more muzzle flip when you're lower on the back strap. Another problem you're going to have is it's going to notice here I have the right amount of finger on the trigger, but here notice I can only put a lesser amount of finger on the trigger because what's happened is I've actually moved, I've increased the distance from the web of my hand to the trigger. It's shorter from here to here than it is from here to here. Now as I go to the rear, another thing that happens is the trigger wants to go to the rear and up, but I'm pulling in this direction. Now, not only am I fighting against that upward movement of the trigger, but I'm also fighting against the curvature of the trigger. So, the trigger will feel heavier. So, in order for the trigger to feel its proper weight, in order for the geometry to work properly, in order to reduce your muzzle flip high on a back strap. I know that's a fairly lengthy explanation, but I can tell you, I've been on the range a lot of times where an instructor has just walked up and said, get higher on the back strap, without ever telling me why that's important. And uh, while I am criticized sometimes for my videos going a little bit long because I excessively explain things, one thing you won't be after you've listened to something I've instructed on is left in the dark. I'm going to explain the why a lot because I find for a lot of people understanding the why helps make that advice resonate a little deeper with them. So that's why I over explain things sometimes. Please bear with me on that. So we've established now high on the back strap so that we have the proper trigger geometry and we fight that muzzle flip. Now once the, the weapon is in your hand, of course there's a, another factor that comes in is you want a straight line that basically goes from the front side to your wrist to your elbow all the way down. You don't want the gun cocked to one side or the other. And you'll find this with some guns, especially if people are shooting a gun that's too big for them is they'll snake their hand over like this so they can get enough finger on the trigger. Now what's going to happen here is you have a very poor grip on the gun, you're going to experience a lot of muzzle flip, you're going to have a lot of problems with recoil on stiffer loads because this is now recoiling into your the joint and this joint doesn't bend in this direction very effectively. Uh, in fact, this is a bit of a control hold here, locking this joint out and pressing there actually applies pain and we don't want to do that, so that's not going to work. And there's some cases where somebody may have a gun too small and to get the right amount of trigger on there they actually go around and what happens is on presentation the gun is pointed hard left, on presentation the gun is pointed hard right. You want that to be a straight line, and a good way to, to determine whether or not you're drawing consistently to a straight line is to draw the gun from the holster. Now, this will be during dry practice with a, a weapon that has been cleared and you're doing it in a safe environment, but to draw from the holster, bring the gun up to eye level with your eyes closed. Then open your eyes and see how well aligned your sights are. It's going to tell you a lot about your grip. It's going to tell you if you're gripping and the gun is not centered in your hand because ideally when you open your eyes, you should see everything roughly aligned. It won't be perfectly aligned, but it'll be aligned enough. 
Um, uh, another thing also you'll determine is whether or not you tend to point high or point low. Um, this isn't so much of a problem with revolvers, but I found certain autoloaders, um, I do that. For instance, um, when I tried Glocks for a little bit, I would do that and every single time I would open my eyes, my sights would be incredibly high because the grip angle is different than conventional American-made autoloaders. So there you go. Um, but you want everything to be relatively squared up in the hand and you want to make sure you've done that enough so that's good and clean and consistent and you don't really have to think about reorienting the gun in the hand. Now the amount of grip, and this is where the grip begins to become very, very important. So if you're shooting the gun one-handed, there's a reason we don't train to shoot one-handed. Now I was once told by an instructor, it's called a handgun for a reason. If two hands were needed, it'd be called, be called a hands gun. Um, the guy was also about 87 years old, and this was in the early 80s. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him... I'm going to give him a little credit and okay, very nice, and just ignore that advice. The reason we use two hands is it provides a more stable shooting platform. You get better control over the gun and it's a more efficient way to shoot. And everybody pretty much intuitively knows two-handed shooting is the order of the day. There are times though when one hand is all you've got. This hand may be injured or this hand may be holding something or this hand may be occupied and you can't bring it into play and you have to fire one-handed. It's possible to do. Just understand you're not going to be as accurate and you're not going to be as good on the trigger as you could. But in that case you're going to grip you're going to grip nice and firmly on the gun. I will tell you that the point that you want to grip on is going to be with the little finger and you're going to want to pinch between the thumb and the index finger knuckle like that. So I'm pinching this way and I'm closing down this way. And what that's going to do is going to lock the gun down from uh, canting left or right and it's also going to hold the muzzle down as that muzzle begins to recoil. Again it's going to fulcrum against the web of your hand and this is going to anchor it right here. So your anchor point is going to be there and there and there and there. So one-handed firing grip is possible, and the reason I don't grip too hard with these two fingers is the inner limb interaction I'm going to talk about in just a moment. But for 99.9% .9 of the rest of the time when you shoot two-handed, here's how it's going to go. So the firing hand grips down, and this thumb, you want to do something about this thumb, and you want to do it fairly early. And what you want to do with a revolver is you want to get this thumb down. Don't extend the thumb out. Now there is that autoloader shooting technique where it's thumbs forward like this. Does not work very well with revolvers. And I'm going to tell you why. If you've got a hand the size of mine, or if you're shooting a little bitty gun like this, and this is where it really becomes important. So if I grip down, I go thumbs forward. Look how much of my thumb is in this area right here. Now what we have here is we have our forcing cone, we have our cylinder. There's a little air gap called the cylinder gap right there. And when you press, and if you have seen some high impulse rounds fired, you have seen flame and all kinds of weird stuff come out. In fact, look at the top strap of your gun if it's been fired enough, and you'll actually see a little notch that's been cut there, and that's called flame cutting. What happens is hot exhaust gases come out of that come out of that point, as well as sometimes little fragments of shaved lead, little pieces of unburnt powder. In short, what will happen is the tip of your thumb is going to get peppered and it's going to become uncomfortable. Now that's with 38 Special. If you're shooting a high impulse round, now this is a 44 Special, but uh, I have another one of these that's a 44 Magnum, uh, and that's about as high as I go. I don't have anything more powerful than that when it comes to uh, revolvers, but there was a guy that was shooting one of those Smith & Wesson X frames, and he was shooting 460 Roland, I believe, and did the same thing. Had his thumb well forward like that, fired it, and it took a good piece of his thumb off. So you're going to want to keep all keep your thumbs away from that. So. Close your thumb down. Get this out of the way because you don't want it to be getting in the way of anything else. The support hand is now going to come in and also notice fingers of the hand as high up as possible and, uh, and they can't go any higher than that and you don't want them any lower than that. But your support hand is going to come in and that index finger, your support hand, is going to come right up under the trigger guard and you're going to roll this palm down and you're going to press your palms together. And then you're going to lock everything down. So this thumb then just locks over that thumb and we've got a nice fully encircled grip. At that point the grip pressure and which hand applies more or less grip pressure becomes important. Because this hand only has one job. This, the support hand, its only job is to grip as tightly as it can on that gun and keep it from moving. And the, why do we want to keep this from moving? Well, there's a number of reasons, and they relate to both the trigger and they relate to the follow-through. 
As you are cycling this trigger to the rear, you're going to be applying 10 to 14 pounds of pressure to a trigger that's going to sweep through about a three quarter of an inch arc. As you do this, as you press to the rear, you're going to press the gun into the meaty portion of your hand. That's going to produce some movement. There's not a lot you can do about that. And that's why you always see a little bit of movement of the sight when you're pressing the trigger. But if you're not holding the gun very tightly, what's going to happen is as you're pressing the gun, or pressing the trigger rather, um, the gun is going to shift and move. And in a lot of cases, it's going to shift for a right-handed shooter. It's going to shift hard left. Because as you apply the pressure, you're closing that fist down. You're pressing against the trigger. But because your finger isn't completely perpendicular to the trigger, it's more angled, it's going to come back. So it's going to leave at the same point of uh, entry. So it's going to entry enter at 45 degrees and depart at 45 degrees. So you're going to press the gun slightly sideways. You counter that by applying grip pressure and the grip pressure prevents the gun from moving at all throughout the entire stroke of the trigger. Now again you're going to get a little bit of movement as you can see it's just a little bit of wobble but the difference at, at say 10 yards is quarter of an inch at 25 yards it's about an inch and a half two inches that's all that's going to do now you can really tighten that down and you can stage your trigger and do that double action target shooting stuff that I'm going to tell you not to do and you can all the way out to 25 35 yards you can hit accurately with it um, and that's a more advanced skill I'm not saying it's a bad thing I am saying from a combat shooting perspective it should just be a straight to the rear and, and back and I'll discuss that in the trigger uh, control section of it but the whole idea here is the grip pressure that is provided by the support hand is going to be about 70% of the grip pressure. So most of your grip pressure is going to come from your support hand. When it locks down, it's going to lock down and lock everything in place. And that's going to leave the firing hand to be a little bit more relaxed. Now because this hand has a couple of jobs to do, it can become a problem with inner limb interaction. And the way inner limb interaction works is this. Uh, our body is pr pretty much split directly down the center. The, the right side of your body mirrors the left side of your body and its physiological makeup. This arm looks just like this arm. This hand looks just like this hand. And they are connected. Although they are separate units and they can operate independently, they are connected to a certain degree. And if you squeeze down real strongly with this hand or this hand, the other hand, they want to duplicate that action. There's even been some cases where people have been negligently shot because someone had their finger on the trigger, then went to grab a suspect and then pull on him. And when he did, this hand closed tightly and actually fired the weapon. That's happened many, many, many times. So why we don't put our finger on the trigger until we made the decision to shoot. But when it comes to this hand, there is an inner limb interaction that occurs between the fingers of your hand because all of these tendons are kind of connected down the same root. So when these three fingers tighten down, and if all three fingers tighten down pretty dramatically, and this finger, which needs to be extended and flexible to run the trigger, what happens is if you grip too hard with these three fingers, this finger wants to curl down automatically. Not so much that it's going to fire the weapon, but you, you stress out the tendons enough that the finger is less flexible so it doesn't smoothly operate the trigger. So you want to relax this hand as much as you can so that this trigger finger remains free to, to move without binding up. Hope you follow along with that. So once you grip down and lock your thumbs down, the other hand comes in. Most of your grip pressure comes from your support hand. You lock in. Then you can hold the weapon nice and steady. You can relax that shooting hand and then you can just stroke that trigger nice and smoothly with no problem whatsoever. So that's the importance of grip. And the other importance of grip is going to be when it relates to follow through. And when I get to the subject of follow through, I'll come back and touch on grip once again. But it's important that this grip doesn't change or relax until you've made the decision to come offline and you're not shooting anymore. Once you start shooting, this grip locks down and you don't relax it ever. Not once you've fired the round, not once you've fired the second round, you lock that gun down and it doesn't move. And also you want to lock that gun down and resist the recoil as much as possible. You don't let recoil happen. You fight recoil. Because if you begin to relax, and I, I realize I'm skipping ahead to follow through just a little bit, but a, a big mistake that a lot of shooters make is that they will fire around and they will relax their hand after they fired the shot. The problem is they relax their hand too early and the bullet has not even left the barrel yet. 
because as I'll talk about in a follow through, this is a dwell time. There's a measurable amount of time between when the hammer falls, strikes the firing pin, ignites the powder charge, the gases expand, force the barrel, force a bullet down the barrel and out towards the target. That's an actual amount of time and it's actually longer than you think it is. And there's been many times where people have got their sights lined up and they press their shot and then they relax or they take their attention off the sights or they, or they release the trigger too early. And in doing so, they shift the gun slightly before the bullet has even left the barrel. And that results in a shot going off paper, or not off paper, but off of its intended point of aim. And uh, I'll talk about that a lot more in the follow through or uh, follow through section. But grip is just as important as it relates to follow through. So I think that's all I can talk about at this point on grip. There's more to talk about relating to grips themselves and, and a few other things that I'll do in a separate video. But everything begins, everything starts, your foundation to operating the trigger starts with a good solid grip. So with that, I will bring this to an end and we'll move on to the next uh, installment, which is going to be talking about actual uh, sight, uh, sight picture. So with that, we'll break at this point. And as I mentioned in all my videos, if you're interested in uh, supporting our activities here, please visit us at SpectreGear.com. We have a number of very interesting revolver-related products that you might find uh, interesting, as well as slings, pouches, etc. So please be sure to stop by at uh, SpectreGear.com and check those out. So I thank you for watching and or listening. This is Scott with SpectreGear. Have a wonderful day.